time. People proclaiming this trendy phrase, I'm spiritual, but not religious. I hear it in conversations. It's included on, in profiles on dating websites. Must admit that even I have said this in the past, before I had any clue that I had no clue what the hell I was talking about. Now, while I understand stand the need to separate yourself from the dirty laundry of institutionalized religion, what the hell does it mean to be spiritual? Does it mean what? You do yoga, you meditate, you feel a sense of awe at the beauty of a butterfly? Maybe you believe in a spiritual realm, or maybe even pray to some supernatural higher power. Are there any prerequisites for qualifying as spiritual? And by the way, spiritual realm? Ugh. Does the concept have any meaning, or as George Carlin once quipped, spirituality is another way of forgetting who we really are? An interesting point by a smart man. May I suggest, however, that while we have muddied the meaning of the term with spooky talk, there is something there, something in the word spirituality that we are trying to grasp. And that something may have value. So I'm going to say a definition. You, you can let me know if you think it's kooky or, or not. Spirituality is the conscious effort to relate to experience beyond the invocation of representations. We all come into this world the same way, naked, screaming, pissing, shitting, without pretense. When we want to eat, we cry till we eat. When we want to sleep, we sleep. When we want to shit, we shit. We have no need for social restrictions. So truly, as an infant, who you are is right out in the open for the world to see. Now as we get older, we start to realize there is this punishment reward system in our place meant to control your behavior. You want to eat? Can't eat now. Want to sleep? Can't sleep yet. Want to shit? Better hold it or either your parents or peers will shame you into constipation. In fear of this social shame is the heightened awareness of your dependence on a broader narrative called culture with its concept of normal. To fit into this cultural narrative requires a modulation of our actual inner world of itches, needs, pressures. These modulations are a compromise that become our personality. Essentially, then, we are relating to the world through a representation of our actual selves. This representation we call the ego. Throughout our lives, we add layer upon layer to this representation. We become straight-A students, athletes of the year, first chairs, hippies, beatniks, hit songwriters, parents, or YouTube personalities, or the Kardashians. We feed our representations with narratives that obscure the vulnerability in which we were born. And after this grand performance, we die. But don't worry. They'll dress our funeral up with fine ornamentation, the best pictures of us they can find, the trophies, the awards, the purple hearts, and certificates of accomplishment. They'll say how great we were and how good we look. Of course, the most tearful are those who saw us at our ugliest and most vulnerable, stripped of our representations. Now, as I've said, our claim to fame on the Darwinian hierarchy is our ability to see patterns which we weave together to create narratives. Somewhere like a scarlet macaw perched on the branches of those narratives, our ego cries out to be recognized. In our growing awareness of how complex this tree of life is, we are brought face to face with our own significance. Our ego spends a great deal of time in denial of this insignificance. We feel that by achieving some standard, some higher branch, we can earn some significance. So we sharpen our talents, we sculpt our bodies, we comb our hair, go to self-improvement seminars, brighten our feathers, and start YouTube vlogs. Look at the people we worship, our celebrities, our athletes, the ones deemed worthy to walk the red carpet or model for iron statues and imprint their hands in cement. What is it about them? Is it that they truly occupy a higher state of existence? Are they super evolved? Is it truly them? 
the brief images we see of them in magazines and on movie screens, almost by definition, these are not them. They are airbrushed versions of airbrushed versions of themselves. And surely we know a few of these superstars who have effectively drowned in the reflections of themselves, drowned in their own representations. Many of these are the ones we chase for autographs and long to be like. We've memorized the lines. We know the stories and the heroic deeds they've been scripted to do. And we know how it all turns out in the end, when the credits roll over triumphant music. Just remember, even after our hero rides off into the sunset, he'll still go to sleep, wake up the next day, have a cup of coffee, and then take a nice steaming shit. It is in the moments where we are thrown off balance and come crashing down from the high that we return to our true selves, who we are, stripped from the lies, their personas, the representations of our actual selves. These may be brief moments, transient epiphanies until we go grasping at the vines of our egos. What if spirituality is the conscious effort to approach that authentic ground? To climb downward, in a sense, attempting to be as connected as we were as infants without having to poop our pampers. So if asked to say if I was religious, I'd say, not really but I can dig the soaring sound of a Muslim call to prayer or the festive pulse of a klezmer band or the feel as I turn the pages in a Bible. Sure, even as an agnostic. If asked to say if I am spiritual, I'd also say, not really. But I can appreciate the times when life knocks me off the branches of my own narratives to wind up face down in the mud of my own authenticity. Maybe it is in that mud that we discover who we truly are. Swallow, but the rhymes make easy. All the words that I know.